today, I want to encourage you to place yourself in the environment that God has provided for you. The environment of His community who are here to strengthen and sharpen you and build you up when you're feeling weak. Now is your chance to come to life, no matter how long it's been. But how many of you are ready for the Word of God this morning? Come on, I get to bring God's Word to you. I'm excited. God's Word is living. It's alive. It's a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. It's, it's guiding us in every way. So today, as we open our Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4. Ezekiel 1 verse 4 says this as I looked I saw a great storm coming from the north driving before it a huge cloud that flashed with lightning and shone with brilliant light there was the fire inside the cloud and in the middle of the fire glowed something like gleaming amber from the center of the cloud came four living beings that looked human, except that each had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet had hooves like those of a calf and shone like burnished bronze. Under each of their four wings, I could see human hands. So each of their four beings had four faces and four wings. The wings of each living being touched the wings of the being beside it. Each one moved straight forward in any direction without turning around. Each had a human face in the front, the face of a lion on the right side, the face of an ox on the left, and the face of an eagle at the back. These are the four faces of Jesus. And since the theme of the entire Bible is Messiah, Lord, Savior, Jesus. Today I want to talk to you for a few moments on the four faces of Jesus. Let's bow our heads and pray. God, thank you for your love. God, thank you for your grace. I pray that your presence will infiltrate this place right now, God. Let your word ring true and change us today. We love you. and We love SCC. And everybody said, amen. Hey, give two people a high five and say, you looking good. And then you can be seated. Come on, somebody. I'm excited about this message. And I want to make it applicable to you today because I truly believe in these four faces. There's a truth that all of us need to get today. So each one of these faces represents a different quality that Jesus has, but each face also represents one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So the first face is the face of a man. The man signifies the humanity of Jesus. Jesus is presented to us as a man in the Gospel of Luke. And you'll see that the genealogy of Luke is actually the genealogy of Mary. It's different than the genealogy in Matthew, that's of Joseph, but the genealogy of Mary in Luke doesn't just go back to Abraham, it goes all the way back to the first man of Adam. When the angel came to Mary and told her she was gonna have a baby, one of the things he said to her is that he would be called the son of the Most High. So we stop there and we think, well, that was Jesus' name the rest of his life when he went to elementary school, middle school, high school. What's up, son of the most high? There's the son of the most high. Son of the most high. But it's not that. It's actually the opposite. Whenever you see someone talk to him and call him son of the most high, it's usually a demon or Satan. And it's more of an accusation than an honor saying, you're son of the most high. You belong in heaven. What are you doing down here in our territory? You've come to pester us. But here's the thing that Luke does. The gospel of Luke is this heavy, heavy emphasis. And as a new Christian, you would ask, why is this in the Bible? Okay. 88 times in the Bible, he calls himself son of of man. Jesus, I'm trying to tell everyone you're the son of God. You're the son of the most high. You're kind of messing up my theory here. You're calling yourself the son of man, the son of man. But understand it takes nothing away from the virgin birth. It takes nothing away from him being the son of God. 
But he said this because he wants to illustrate a very important point that I could take you scripture by scripture. We don't have time to go through all of them, but the best way to signify it is through this parable. John 10 and 1, it says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold, rather than going through the gate, must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus goes on in that chapter to say, everyone that came before him is a thief, an imposter, and just not welcome. God, are you saying that all the apostles, all the great men, Moses, that came before you, they're, they're thieves and robbers? No, God's not saying that at all. The thing that you have to understand in this parable is we have to define what the sheepfold is. What is the sheepfold? Many people misinterpret this thinking the sheepfold is um, referring to heaven. You can find a back door into heaven. Climb over a back wall. Can I tell you this? When you die, you've either accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior or they're going to ship your saddle in a different direction, partner. We're not talking heaven right here. We're talking about earth. Who are the sheep? The sheep are you and me. God is our shepherd. And it's talking about earth. Jesus is saying this. If you come to the earth, you come through the door. The door is the womb of a woman. He said, I was born through a woman and I have the right to be here. That's why I call myself over and over again, the son of man. All the demons, evil spirits, fallen angels, they've climbed over the wall. They're imposters, they're thieves, they're robbers. I have a right to be here. I came the exact same way that you came. I am the son of man. And that's what Jesus is saying right here. So the first face of Messiah is the face of man. Why would he do that? Well, number one, to restore the relationship that he had with God, redemption. Does anybody in here ever get mad just thinking about Adam, how he screwed everything up for us? I mean, when I see Adam in heaven, I'm gonna punch him right in his nose, you know? I'm just gonna drop kick him like, why'd you mess it up for us, man? What's your problem? But maybe not all of us haven't eaten the fruit that Adam did, but all of us have done the same thing Adam did. Yeah, all of us have screwed up, right? All of us have messed up, just like Adam. But I love the order of Almighty God because it would take only one to lose our relationship with God, but it would require only one to restore it. Amen. Come on. Jesus came to give redemption. He restored. He redeemed our relationship. So first of all, for redemption, why did Jesus become a man? Number two, for communication. Yeah, I've heard it said that Jesus came to earth so that he could learn to relate to us, so he could understand human beings. Can I tell you right now, God knows all. He doesn't need to understand anything. Think about this. God has never had an idea. He's never been sitting around and said, I just thought of something. Because when you know it from the beginning to the end, you know all. Amen? Amen. And he came to communicate with us, not so that he could understand us, that was already done, but so that we could understand him. He put himself in our place into every possible situation. You will never be tempted in a way that Jesus has not already been tempted. He's been tempted under the most intense, power-packed situation. And guess what? Jesus was the perfect human. He was the perfect man, and he lived the perfect life. So when we see this very first time, in the Bible that Jesus communicates, we probably need to pay attention to the first letters in red. Okay, what did Jesus do the first time that he communicated? Luke 2, 46 says, three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious leaders. Did everyone get that first part three days later? Mary and Joseph lost Jesus for three days. I don't know about you parents. This gives me hope as a parent. This makes me feel great. I just want to stop. This has nothing to do with anything. That just makes me feel great. Thank you, Jesus. Put that in there to encourage me. What was he doing? Sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them, and asking questions. The first thing Jesus ever did in the Bible, he was listening, and he was asking questions. If we're going to be good Christians, we have to learn to listen. We have to learn to listen before we speak, before we talk. James says this, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to get angry. Friends, we've got to learn 
to communicate with God effectively. And we've got to learn to open our eyes to communicate with those that are around us effectively. Husbands and wives, God has given you a spouse to communicate with them effectively. God has not given you them for them to annoy you. God has given them to you so that you will listen to them and they have the answer many times, but because they are a familiar face, a familiar voice, we can ignore them. Sure, the business opportunity comes in. We perk up. We are communicating on all cylinders. They walk out the door. We slump down again. Let me tell you, figure out how to communicate effectively with your mate. And you know, I'm learning. I'm five years into this thing. Marriage And I'm learning the rules of engagement, of communication with my mate. And one of the rules is this. When I wake up in the morning, that's not time to communicate right away. (laughs) Okay, I'll wake up, and Sarah goes into the kitchen. She takes some coffee. She puts it in a syringe. She injects it into her veins. And 30 minutes later, it's time to communicate. Amen? Amen. And I love talking to Sarah about ministry. I love talking to her about our children. I love talking to her about our future. I would not want to do it any other way. I want her opinion. I want to learn how to communicate with her better and better. We've got to open our eyes to those around us. We've got to learn how to communicate effectively with our children. You know, I love watching Netflix documentaries. There's so much stuff on there. There's some good stuff. And I was watching a documentary on Tiger Woods the greatest golfer of all time. And his dad was very instrumental in raising him, coaching him, training him, giving him the confidence to become what he was. At two or three, he was already an accomplished golfer. And in this documentary, Tiger Woods said this. He said, growing up, he said, my father would never stand over me and talk down to me. He said, whenever my father communicated with me, he always got down on his knee, no matter how young I was. He would get down on the green and sit down to make sure we were eye level. So he knew that I knew that we were on the same level. I felt valued. I felt like my opinion mattered. We were communicating. Friends, we've got to learn how to communicate effectively and make those around us feel valuable. Amen? The second face is the face of a lion. The lion is a symbol of kingship. Jesus is the lion, and he's presented to us as the king in the gospel of Matthew. When you see the genealogy in the first chapter of Matthew, this is a different genealogy than the one with Mary. This is the royal line. This is the kingship. This goes back to King David. You got King David, King Solomon, Rehoboam. Then you get to this jerk named Jehoiakim. Okay, Jehoiakim, he was... He was so evil that Jeremiah came to him and said, never again will anyone in your line sit on the throne of Israel. You're finished. You're done. Hold up, Jeremiah. You're just messing up a prophecy that's been given to David already because Samuel told him, your house and your kingdom, David, will continue before me for all time and your throne will be secure forever. You just canceled out God's word. And never again did anyone in the house of Jehoiakim sit on the throne of Israel. They were taken off into captivity when they came back, never again. It looked like God's word would not be fulfilled, but God loves doing stuff like this. He loves messing it up, making it look impossible so only a miracle can set things straight, amen? I love that he put Mary as his mother, as his earthly family for the biological connection to David, but Joseph and Matthew, is selected because he is of the royal house. Had there not been sin before him, get this, Joseph was the rightful heir to sit on the throne of Israel. Jesus was not his biological son, his adopted son. So therefore, he had every right to sit on the throne of Israel. When Jesus hung on the tree in Golgotha and it said, King of the Jews, it wasn't just symbolic. Friends, it was the truth. Don't you love the order of Almighty God? He takes care of every facet. And Jesus, he's the king and he has all the power. What do kings do? They rule and reign, but kings also rule protect. If we're going to be a strong body of Christ, we have to protect each other. Friends, when people walk in these doors, they can't ever feel like they're going to be singled out, called out, 
be made to feel like they're less than. And when people walk in these doors, it can't feel weird. I'm just going to be honest with you. You say, Denny, you don't want the Holy Spirit to move? Absolutely. These walls were built by the Holy Spirit, but I don't want unwanted spirits in this place. We are protectors of the house of God. And you say, how do you know between a true prophecy and a false prophecy or someone that misses it? Well, let me tell you, if you get a true prophecy over your life, true word from God, that word's going to hover over you for at least a week, and the Holy Spirit's going to minister. What's it going to minister? Peace and healing. Do you heal that, hear that? Peace and healing will be in your spirit. True prophecy. What about false prophecy? Well, a dark cloud is going to hover over you. And the one thing that's going to come to you over and over again is confusion, confusion, confusion. That's what the enemy comes to do is to confuse you. And there's nothing more revolting than a false prophet. But listen to me. There's nothing that delights the heart of God more than an anointed prophet. I've been talking to dad, and they just got back from Miami. Now they're in Columbia, Prophet Paez. And while they were in Miami, they were at Trinity Church at Rich Wilkerson's church. They had three days of just an incredible meeting time. And the same thing that happened here happened in Miami. When Prophet Paez left, everyone felt healed. They felt like they were on a new level with Jesus. And they felt more in love with Almighty God than ever before. And when a true prophet leaves, that's how you feel. But when a false prophet or someone that comes in here and ministers out of the wrong context or feeling, you leave thinking more about the prophet than Jesus. And listen to me, there's certain people that come to this house to minister, and dad is a lion. He will never have them again. Because he's a protector, he will never criticize. He will never speak evil of them. He will simply never give them access to you again. And listen to me. Sometimes you may wonder why certain relationships you depended on have ended. You have to understand the Lord is a lion. And sometimes you don't understand it, but he's watching after you. He is protecting you. We serve the great protector. How do we fight our battles, friends? We fight our battles on our knees in prayer, saying, God, I plead the blood to the great protector. I plead the blood to the one that knows the beginning to the end. I plead the blood, but I protect those around me, and I trust that you will fight my battles for me. If you're trusting God to fight your battles, give him some praise right now. Come on, we serve. Hey, we serve the great protector. The next face is the face of an ox. The ox is a symbol of serving. Jesus is the ox, and he's presented to us as the ox in the gospel of Mark. There is no genealogy in Mark, like in Luke or Matthew, why? Because the genealogy of a servant is inconsequential. It's all about other people. And in this book, you see 73 times in the Bible the reference Lord to Jesus, Lord. But in the book of Mark, it's only used two times and only after the resurrection because the theme of Mark is that Jesus has come to be a servant and that is why there is no record of him being called Lord until he's been raised from the dead. Mark's purpose is to show the face of the ox. The ox spends all of its time serving, helping, thinking of other people, giving of themselves for others, giving of themselves to help other people go through things. We don't serve for power. We serve because we care. We're the servant leaders. What I want you to get, moms and dads, is that God has given you these children to steward. And we need to start looking at our children as sons and daughters of the Most High. One day we will be standing shoulder to shoulder with our children, lifting our hands, worshiping Jesus. Yes, there's a firm place for discipline. There's a firm place for order in the household. But never do we want to injure our children so they don't become what God has called them to be. Let me tell you, we've got to serve our family and we've got to serve our kids. And Jesus was an ox. Jesus was a servant, so you would assume that the book of Mark isn't powerful at all, right? It's just getting run over, your servant, it's not the good stuff. Let's pass by Mark, let's go to another one. No, serving equals power. Everyone say that with me. Serving equals power. One more time. Serving equals power. That's where all the power is. When you serve, everything changes, 
The Greek words for immediately and straightway occur 26 times in the Gospel of Mark. It refers to when Jesus prayed, boom, immediately things happened. Mark shows Jesus as a man of action. And if you go back and look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you really dissect all of the miracles in the Bible, you'll find out that most of the miracles don't happen downtown Jerusalem where everyone knows Jesus. No, most of the miracles happen in the highways and the byways on the gospel frontier where no one's ever heard of the gospel before. Where did he multiply loaves and fishes? It wasn't downtown Jerusalem where they could just run to the market if they didn't get a miracle. It's in the middle of nowhere. He had to do a miracle or they would not have eaten. They were serving. Where did God manifest manna from heaven? Where did the manna come from? They were in the wilderness. Let me tell you, we've got to be willing to get in the wilderness, guys, out of the covering of our church, out of these four walls. We've got to find a need and fill it. We've got to find a hurt and heal it. We've got to get out there and serve because that is where all the power is. And I look at this church, and I just see servant after servant leader. I mean, you guys are incredible. I could preach a sermon on each and every one of you guys. I love you all so much. But one person I love is, is Rowdy. Rowdy is just like his name. Whatever he does, he does 100%. Whatever it is, he's ready, right? Let's go. And he serves no matter how small it is, no matter how great. He's ready to serve. He came to me five months ago, and he said, Denny, I don't know what to do. What's my next step in this whole process? I said, you need to get your education, okay? What's your next step in education? And he said, well, I need to get my high school diploma. Go get it. Two months later, he shows up, I got it, man. What's next? Let's go. What's next? I said, well, actually, you know what? You need to go to college, and we're starting a college in August. That window right there, that top left window, we're busting out all the walls right here. It's going to be SC College, and you're going to be one of the first students. Where do I sign up, man? What do I do? How do I get there? He's not asking questions. He's just ready to go. Yesterday, he was in here setting up all these chairs with Eagle Creek. Can we, give, can we give them a round of applause for setting all this stuff up? I love the format of the sanctuary right now. This is one of my favorite setups ever. And we're sitting in the back just looking and, and planning. I looked at him and I said, bro, by the time this is all said and done, just because of your servant heart, just because you're willing to do anything, we're going to see God do miracles like you could never imagine. And God is going to use you, Rowdy, to do it. Come on, Rowdy's not here today, but let's give him a round of applause anyway. He's serving. He's a servant. He took Pastor Irv and uh, Pastor Patrick to Dallas. There it is, the servant. But listen to me. When you're serving people, there will be times when you're humbled. There will be times when you look stupid. There will be times when you do things that are unpopular or that people don't understand because serving God is not about your ego. It's about doing what's best for other people. And I love SCC because together we're going to serve this church. We're going to serve Jesus. We're going to serve this city. We're going to see God do amazing, incredible miracles all together. Come on, give God some praise. If we're going to be the house of serving, I believe it. Thank you, Jesus. And the worship team can go ahead and come up here. I'm closing. The fourth face is the face of an eagle. The eagle is the symbol of resurrection. Jesus is the eagle and is presented to us as the eagle in the gospel of John. No other book will you see Jesus speaking more about death and resurrection than in the book of John. There is no genealogy in the book of John, because Jesus is introduced to us as the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We see him as the Word. You know, new Christians see this and say, wait a minute, what the Word is the Word? Who's, is Jesus the Word? And he already was? What, what's going on? What we have to understand is that Jesus lived before Bethlehem. He did not come into existence at a stable. He's the eternal Word of God. And you see this in the Gospel of John. He's the Son of God, the eternal Word, the Word made flesh. No other book than the book of John will you find the powerful, amazing I Am's. I Am 
the I am. I love John 18 where Jesus makes John Wayne look like a little boy scout. Jesus is the dude. He's the man. He's been praying all night long on his face before God, and he decides it's time for me to give it all. An angry mob approaches him, and Jesus is all by himself. And all alone, Jesus faces them and says, Whom ye seek? And they look at him and they say, We want Jesus of Nazareth. And bowed up, Jesus says, I am he. And the power of that moment threw them back and they fell on their faces. No human has ever felt such a demonic attack in all of human history. And when they picked their faces up, they came to him and all alone he said, I am. In that moment, he gave himself for no one took him. He said in John, no one takes my life for I lay it down. Let me tell you, no one took Jesus. No one martyred him. He gave it all on a cross. He laid it down on a cross for you and me so that we could have eternal life. But what I want you to understand is this, is that the principle that we all have to learn is that Jesus said, any man that does not take up his cross and follow me cannot call himself my disciple. Today, in this day and age, more people are giving their life for Jesus than at any time in history. More martyrs, more people giving their life for Jesus. Some people will give their life for Jesus, but most of us won't. But listen to me, God will require you to lay some things down in your life. You know, growing up, um, I always heard this story of dad being in the Washington Redskins camp. NFL, right? Every little kid's dream. He's about to be a quarterback in the NFL. And right in the middle of the Washington Redskins training camp, he walks into the head coach's office and in my dad's style shares Jesus with the head coach and then says, coach, thank you for the opportunity, but God's calling me elsewhere. I'm retiring. I'm finished with football. He laid down a career in the NFL. Well, I was like, what in the world, dad? Could have been in the NFL as a little kid. I never understood that. It made me so mad, you know? And then right after that, he went to Evangel College and he began their football program over there, 24 years old. And he's the head coach of a college, the youngest coach in America. It was crazy. He was younger than some of the athletes, you know? I mean, he dated half of the cheerleading squad. It was crazy. That's not true. Don't tell him I said that. He's not here. I'll be in trouble. But God did an amazing work in the cheerleading squad. That I'm kidding. I'll stop. God did an incredible work at Evangel, Christian, uh, Evangel College for six years. God just moved. And last year, I was able to go to the 40th year reunion of the beginning of Evangel College football. And I stood in a room of hundreds of players and coaches, and one by one they stood up and they gave their testimonies. And they said, you know what, at Evangel College, God changed my life. And it sounded a lot like this. I'd never heard of Evangel College before, but this young coach came in and he convinced my parents and me that I should go there. And for some reason, I don't know why I did, I did. And today, let me tell you, I got a great ministry. I got a great family. I got a great business. Testimony after testimony. One of those players' names was Mike Back. And Mike Back was a freshman on that team. Mike ended up following dad back to Shreveport after Evangel College. He founded Eagle Creek Recovery Center where thousands of men have walked through the doors and had their lives totally transformed by the power of Jesus. Can we hear it for Eagle Creek right now? You're the heroes of this house. We love you so much. There's a guy by the name of Keith Kraft. He was 6'6", six, six, this tall, gangly basketball player. You know what I mean? Dad couldn't even convince him to play football. But Keith saw something in Dad that he wanted. So Keith started following Dad around, started singing his songs, started preaching his messages. Then he got a power team, gained some weight, started crushing bricks. Then he founded a church in Frisco, Texas. Today, they run thousands of people every Sunday morning. Keith travels around the world sharing the stage with presidents and some of the most famous people that you could ever know. Let me tell you, my dad laid something down precious, but God 
has never let him down. That's been a theme of my dad's life, and it's the greatest thing you can ever do. Let me tell you, don't ever be scared to come to your cross. Don't ever be scared to lay something down for Jesus. Because here's what I'm here to tell you today, is that on the other side, God has a glorious resurrection that will blow your mind. Whatever you give, give up, he'll give back to you over and above. We serve the God of the resurrection. We serve the God of life. We serve the God that we're going to be with him for all of eternity. Come on, I want you to get on your feet and just give God some praise if you love him. Tell Jesus how much you love him.